This is Dr. Tuckman. I'm going to be presenting a percutaneous fixation of a dorsal fracture dislocation of the PIP joint. I'd like to thank Dr. Strouch for developing this technique as well as for his help on this video. The patient is a 17-year-old young woman who presented three days after an injury to her middle finger. If we zoom in on the lateral, there's an articular fracture of the volar half of the base of the middle phalanx. The fracture looks very innocuous at first glance, but in further inspection, there's a dorsal V-sign. There is also a central area of impaction, which is responsible for the complete flattening of the articular surface, which is causing dorsal subluxation and the dorsal V-sign. There is also a volar avulsion fracture from the volar plate, and if taken in isolation, would clearly only require buddy taping. You can consider treating this with only dorsal extension block splint, but my concern would be the impaction of the joint and complete loss of the concavity of the joint would lead to a suboptimal result. This is an intraoperative floor shot that shows the impaction and the significant volar instability. We have a few surgical options for this injury. We can consider wire forms, the AG turnkey, open reduction from a volar approach for which I've done a video a few years ago is an option. Hemi handmade might be an option if the injury was more chronic. Uh, I've done all of these techniques with variable results. I think the best results uh, were with open reduction from a volar approach. Uh, that is until Dr. Stroud showed me this technique, which is a percutaneous pinning with some caveats. At this point, this is my go-to technique and has really given excellent results. I encourage you to read the article in Journal of Hand Surgery by Dr. Vitali, White, and Strouch. It describes the technique and post-op very well. In the technique, they describe a clamp is placed volar dorsal, reducing the fracture and the dorsal subluxation. Pins are then placed from volar and are then pulled out dorsally. This paper showed a couple of very important points in the treatment of this injury. First, you can place a clamp and K-wires through the flexor tendons with relative safety. Second, and I think a vital aspect of this technique is the manipulation after the pins are removed to break up any adhesions. I can't stress the importance of this step enough. I present a variation of this technique where I place the K-wires from dorsal to volar but I really do think it's dealer's choice. A clamp is placed distally on the middle phalanx. This allows traction on the phalanx, which can help when reducing the articular impaction. The first of two K wires is placed at the base of the middle phalanx. One wire will be under the radial side of the joint. The second wire will be ulnar. It is important not to converge the K wires too much since these wires are going to be elevating the impacted articular fragment. The proximal distal starting point is also very important. You want to start approximately three millimeters distal to the joint. These K wires are going to be toggled distally, which will reduce the impacted fragment and then will be advanced into the volar wall fragment. So the proximal distal placement is vital. Too proximal and you'll miss the volar wall fragment. Too distal and you'll end up in the joint. These wires are then advanced to just volar to the impacted fragment. Before the impacted fragment is reduced, a clamp is loosely placed from volar to dorsal. Use the bluntest clamp you have. You want a clamp that is going to push the volar wall, not penetrate it. The K wires are pushed distally, which will reduce the impaction. This is done very gently to avoid over reducing the fragment. Placement of the volar dorsal clamp is fine tuned. You want one tine of the clamp at the articular margin volar, and the dorsal tine of the clamp is placed a little proximal or distal, depending if the volar wall needs to be pushed a little proximally or distally. The clamp is then closed to reduce the volar wall. If needed, distal pressure can be maintained on the wires to hold your reduction. You can use a sponge to prevent the wire from wrapping up your glove. The K wires are then driven out just past the volar wall. 
A dorsal extension block pin is placed to protect the repair. I keep the volar dorsal clamp on until the extension block pin is in. The joint is flexed 30 to 45 degrees. A Ragnall retractor can help flex the joint. X-rays show restoration of the concavity of the joint with a congruent reduction and no dorsal V-sign. I have a very low threshold to make relaxing incisions around the pins. You don't want any tension on the skin as this can lead to pin tract infections. Fingers placed in a volar alumifoam splint. You could do a radial or ulnar gutter splint. At week one, x-rays to confirm maintenance of reduction. At week three and a half to four, the finger is blocked, pins are removed, and probably the most important portion of this procedure is the manipulation. X-rays at three weeks shows the fracture is reduced. There is some gapping of the joint volarly, which can happen from levering off the dorsal extension block pin, which resolves after the pin is removed. The finger is then blocked and the pins are removed. I recommend waiting 10 to 15 minutes before manipulating the finger. The pin size can really sometimes bleed a lot. The patient is asked to fully flex and extend the finger. You can sometimes hear a pop, which is the adhesions breaking up. You can give a little bit of help in flexion while at the same time pushing down on the base of the middle phalanx to unload the fracture. If the DIP doesn't have full extension, you can fully flex the PIP and passively extend the DIP. Patient is placed in a dorsal extension block splint, or you can consider just buddy taping. She was sent for occupational therapy for full active and passive range of motion. X-rays at eight weeks post-op demonstrate a healed fracture with a congruent reduction. Patient maintained their full range of motion and at that point was cleared for full activity. These are two other cases using the same technique. The first is similar to the case in the video with volar impaction of the articular surface and dorsal subluxation and loss of the concavity of the joint treated with volar dorsal pins elevating the articular surface and a dorsal extension block pin yielding an excellent radiographic and clinical outcome. The second case is more of a classic dorsal fracture dislocation with a displacement of the volar wall and impaction of the articular surface with dorsal subluxation, treated with dorsal volar pins with articular reduction and a dorsal extension block pin, yielding as well an excellent radiographic and clinical outcome. Thank you for watching this video. I encourage you to leave comments and let me know what you think.